Thank you for joining us for our continued programming as part of our FSEA online learning experience. My name is Jeff Peterson. I'm the Executive Director of FSEA. Before we join our live webinar event today, I want to remind everyone to visit our virtual trade fair on the homepage of our FSEA online learning experience at www.fsaconference.com. Click into the trade fair area and visit our sponsors. Click on their videos and visit their website. Thank you so much for their support for our first ever online event. I now want to introduce to you Gary Jones. He is the Director of Environmental Health and Safety Affairs for Printing United Alliance. Gary's primary responsibility is to monitor and analyze EHS regulatory activities. In doing so, he works closely with agencies such as the EPA, OSHA, and others. Today, Gary will provide an overview of sustainability in our print industry and where we are with sustainability and some ideas on where we'll be heading. Before we begin, I do want to remind everyone that there should be a little boxed area on your screen where you can write in questions. So as the, as the session goes on, please feel free to write in some questions in that rectangle box and hit the send, and then we can look at getting to as many of those as we can at the end of the session. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Gary Jones. Oh, thank you, Jeff. I'm so excited to be here, and again, um, I uh, really thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. I know we had to switch to a virtual event because of the COVID-19. We were originally scheduled to uh, give this presentation live uh, in <laughs> at the program, but circumstances as they are, we've had to uh, we've had to pivot and adjust and and uh, and do it on a virtual basis. So, yes, I've been asked to speak about the really sustainability in the print in print industry and printing in general, and and. What I what I have in store for us today is a really full agenda of material that we're going to cover. Uh, we, definitely, uh, we want we want to do an update, uh, essentially, you know, a status report, so to speak, in terms of of sustainability. I'm going to do a quick overview in case uh, you may not be familiar with sustainability, um, and talk about the current drivers, what's going on with respect to sustainability. Of course, we can't. Uh, we have to touch a little bit upon the impact of COVID-19 on sustainability because it's been pretty interesting to see how this has evolved and how it's actually touched and impacted the whole concept of sustainability. Talk a little bit about a sustainability action plan, um, and then at the end, we'll talk about the Sustainable Green Printing Partnership, the certification program for for sustainable green printing operations. And hopefully, you'll be interested in after we're done uh, pursuing that that certification and and talking with us further. So. Uh, as I said, we've got a full program. Starting off with, you know, what is sustainability? Now, when you look at the sustainability definition, uh, there are many different definitions that are out there with respect to sustainability. The one that kind of caught my eye is the one from Paul Hawk in a book called Ecology of Commerce. And basically, he defines sustainability as an economic stake where the demands placed upon the environment by people and commerce can be met without reducing the capacity of the environment to provide for future generations. And really, when you, when you embrace that definition, you embrace that concept, it really hits at the core elements of what constitutes sustainability. And essentially, you know, we want to leave the world in a better place than we found it. You know, we take no more than we need and try not to harm life, the environment, or make amends if we do. So the goal is really protection, I think ultimately protection, uh, and preservation of natural resources. And, and on this uh, blue-green planet, you know, we've been blessed with plenty of natural resources. And over the decades and over the, uh, in fact, I would say over longer than the decades, over, over the centuries, uh, you know, we generally have exploited those with little regard to the impact. But, you know, as, as the resources become limited, as the population grows, we have to consider with the impact that we're having on these resources and how we best manage and utilize those to, of course, provide for the modern day lifestyle that we enjoy, but also make sure that we're protecting the planet. I think when you look at sustainability, you know, it boils down to three key components or three pillars of sustainability. And basically it's people, planet, profit. It's quite that simple. I think we need to look at um, the ability to to keep, as I said, keep our planet healthy, keep our planet green, keep it, keep the oceans, the waters clean. Uh, protecting people, very critical in terms of sustainability. 
And from a business perspective, you know that if you don't have people, you can't have a business, right? And then we have to have people because we are people and we need to protect ourselves, our families, our future generations, and of course, profitability, because profitability is critical. If we don't have profitability, uh, we can't support the activities that go towards changing processes or changing materials or looking at ways to do things better. If you're in a situation where there's no profitability there's no, and there's no growth, there's no income, you can't really support the entire sustainable operation. And I know people in the past have asked me, well, Gary, you know, which one of these is more important? And I don't, I don't know that I can say one is more important than the other. I think they're all equally important. And that's kind of why we've, I kind of built this graphic to show that they are the three pillars of sustainability, and all three of them work together uh, to produce and provide for a sustainable environment, a sustainable activity, a sustainable business. You know, um, I think it's critical. So the current state of sustainability. Now, I think um, most of us have realized uh, that something kind of happened uh, with with China, right? If you haven't um, uh, been impacted by that, you would be in the in the slight minority, the rare minority. And so, what's going on in terms of sustainability? Well, what happened is that sustainability has been around, you know, for quite some time. It's really a, it isn't necessarily a new concept, um, but it's emerged recently as being a critical concept. And what do we mean by that? Well. I mentioned and alluded to China. Basically, uh, in, 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 of course, I think it was interesting when China made the announcement that they were going to basically stop being the world's dumping ground for waste. And what, what I meant by that, what I mean by that is that up until uh, essentially 2017, end of 2017, beginning of 2018, China was accepting waste from all over the world. In fact, when you looked at the statistics, about 56% of all plastic waste was going to China. And about 60% of all waste paper was going to China for reprocessing. Why? Because A, China, as we know, has a rather large economy. They have a lot of people employed. And they're, they're resource constrained. They have natural resource constraints. So their, their way of growing their, their economy and, and their society was to take the garbage from the world, pick through it, uh, and basically use the things that they could and then just essentially discard what wasn't, what wasn't available. And after a while, China realized that, hey, this is not a sustainable model for us and our country, and so we're going to stop taking these wastes from across the world. They set very high contam or very low contamination levels, very high standards for the material that they would take, and that, as a result, the imports just dropped like a rock. And it wasn't just here in the United States that we felt that impact. You know, and it's interesting when you think about recycling, at least here at my house, you know, we have the blue bin. And, you know, uh, basically, you know, I thought I was doing my part because I would collect my plastics, I would collect my cardboard, I would collect my paper, put it in my blue bin, and then once a week, you know, the waste management company comes, picks it up, and it goes away. I'm like, oh, I'm doing my part. Well, what we knew, what we realized or didn't realize is that most of that stuff was going to, well, was going to a, a, what they call MRF, a, a, a regional municipal facility where they would pick out some things that were of value. They, they would then bail everything else up and basically send it to China. China said, hey, we don't want it anymore. And that has set off a crisis in terms of what do we do with our waste? Uh, not just, as I said, here in the U.S., but across Europe, across Canada. And now we're trying to grapple with what to do with all this waste that we're generating. A couple other things that have brought this to the forefront. Uh, National Geographic uh, ran a special, Planet or Plastic, and, and there was a focus on plastics, but primarily ocean plastics. And you've heard the term ocean plastics. And if you look on the far right hand side, this, this photo it made, made the worldwide internet. And basically, it, it was a photo of a plastic straw sticking out of a sea turtle's nose. And as a result of that, um, it has triggered a tremendous, these three factors, basically, the China, the, and, and by the way, too, it wasn't just China, it was a lot of countries in Southeast Asia, India, for example, are now also restricting imports of waste, and, and it's forcing the, I would say, the modern countries to figure out a way to deal with the waste, because a lot of that material now is being diverted to landfill, which is not what we want to do. It's not a sustainable operation. But it triggered a lot of reactions, and you can see from the headlines I have at the top of the slide uh, what's happening and what's going on. And then this concept of a circular economy is merged out of these discussions. 
There was a there's a prediction that the circular economy is going to replace the linear linear economy in 10 years. I don't know whether it's 10 years or not. In fact, in some instances, I think it's going to be less than 10 years. In other instances, it may be more than 10 years. Um, questions about why should HR be considered going green? Well, why is that important? Why would HR be considered green and sustainable? Well, because workforce and workforce development issues. When we want to attract and hire young people to get in our industry, we need to recognize that the younger generation, and I'm not in that generation, I'm actually the end of the baby boomer generation, but the, the, the millennials, right? And the term millennial is used, I think, quite liberally. It's just to describe any young person, but there's actually the generation behind millennials is actually more active than the millennials. And one of the reports is that 62% of the Gen Z shoppers demand sustainable retail. Very, very fascinating statistic. So what that means is that if we're going to keep our business sustainable from an operations perspective, we want to bring new people into our operation, we've got to recognize that the, the focus that, that the young folks have is on sustainability. And they want to know as a company, what are you doing to be sustainable? Do I want to work at a company that isn't sustainable? Um, it's, it's really interesting in terms of the dynamics. So yes, we need to consider sustainability from a workforce development issue as well. What we are seeing is because of these pressures, the explosions, the ocean plastics, we've seen a rash of laws that were passed. I mean, uh, it, and I think everyone's pretty much experienced, you know, in a lot of areas, it started with bans on plastic bags, and those have kind of spread across the U.S. There was also a lot of bans on plastic straws, right? And so that was that's an attempt, at least an initial attempt, by some municipalities, governments, and actually businesses to try and address some of these issues. But where we're moving, and, and this I think is quite, I, I do see this as happening, is that we're moving towards what's called a circular economy. And basically what that means is that we're moving away from what they call a linear approach, which is an approach of making something, using it, and basically throwing it away, to an approach where we're going to make it, we're going to reuse it, or we're going to recycle it. So the, the circular economy, as I said, in some, in some instances is already here in certain products. In other products, it's coming, and it's coming, I would say, quite rapidly. In other cases, it's going to be a greater challenge to incorporate, incorporate a circular economy type of approach. A couple concepts of circular economy. Basically, it isn't just one approach, right? There are several different approaches that get engaged in the circular economy. The first, of course, is reduce, You're using design and manufacturing technology to lower material, energy and waste footprints. Uh, we may have ex you may have experienced it if you're in the packaging area, lightweighting. Um, you notice now that a plastic water bottle uh, used to be real thick plastic, now it's a lot thinner plastic. So they're lightweighting packaging uh, and other materials. Uh, there's a reuse aspect where they're offering subscriptions or leasing or shared models rather than basing business on one-off sales. Um, I, RICO is moving towards a reuse model. Uh, we just I just highlighted that in an article that I wrote on the trends and sustainability, and they're and they're looking at um, I believe it's RICO. Yeah, I think it's RICO, uh, where they're looking at uh, leasing you uh, the equipment and then taking the equipment back, breaking the equipment down, and then reusing the equipment, remaking. Designing products that can be demanufactured and, and easily repaired or and remanufactured in new products. Recovering, turning byproducts into new products, or adding recycled content to products and packaging. Uh, and, and of course, renewing, substituting renewables for finite materials, focus on more sustainable sourcing. In other words, incorporating renewable resources into the products that you're doing. And of course, that's pretty, you know, when we look at this, those are pretty abstract types of things. Those are pretty broad goals. Um, I think we, when we look at some of the examples, you'll see where it becomes quite interesting in terms of where, where we're seeing some movement. Again, drivers, climate change is obviously something that's going on in terms of, uh, in terms of what's driving folks to uh, find things that are less carbon intensive. Um, climate change, of course, is a, is a significant driver in a lot of areas and, and, and focusing on how we generate and utilize energy. Uh, there's a big trend in movements towards renewable energy in, in the U.S. Uh, the percent of our total grid that's being uh, supplied by renewable energy sources has been growing and actually has been growing at a rather impressive rate. The Sustainable Development Goals, the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is driving a lot of these. And they have what the UN came out with was a series of 
Sustainable Development Goals. And within those goals, there's, 100, there's 168 metrics within the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and then those are being utilized across uh, countries, across businesses, across industries. Uh, we, we, we do and actually do a, a sustainability recognition program at Printing United Alliance. And we aligned our uh, sustainability program with the sustainability goals in terms of recognizing companies uh, that are committed to sustainability. National regulations and policy. Uh, right now, this is starting to heat up. Uh, in fact, the, the COVID-19, um, I would say, has put a damper a bit on the regulatory and policy aspect. But now that we're trending towards uh, the reopening and trying to get back to get back to normal. There's more debate that's being picked up and more activity being put on this area. And basically, we're looking at greenhouse gas emission limits, uh, extended producer responsibility. Very interesting in terms of extended producer responsibility. Uh, let me take a second to talk about this concept of extended producer responsibility. Essentially, the way that you want to look at extended producer responsibility is it's basically a tax or a fee on paper and packaging. Um, and, and, and what the, the theory, I guess, or the concept behind that is, it, is that since the manufacturer, the pr person that produced the package or brought a product into market, you know, has it in a package, they should be held responsible for the fate of that package. And so the concept behind extended producer responsibility is that a fee is paid, and then that money is used to help in the collection in recycling of those materials that, that are not recycled. Uh, bans on plastic bags, single-use plastics, that's another term that you've heard. Single-use plastics are under a lot of pressure and you've seen people starting to move away from the use of single-use plastics. Uh, packaging, mandatory recycled content and packaging. Chemicals and food packaging is a hot topic right now. There's an issue right going on right now that we're dealing with in Washington State regarding inadvertent PCBs and certain pigments. And of course, California Prop 65 is out there as well, which is a which is a, a chemical driven requirement in terms of providing warning statements. And consumer awareness and activism. The BBC's Blue Planet 2 series, which aired November 2017, the National Geographic focus on ocean plastics, bans on waste import, imports by China has caused a lot of the environmental groups to get engaged. And actually, are, a lot of them, as I said, they've, they've focused, their effort, focused their efforts on an extended producer responsibility. In fact, in Maine of this year, beginning of this year, Maine actually proposed legislation addressing packaging and paper extended producer responsibility. Um, it, the bill uh, was debated. The bill was not voted final. And what's interesting, though, is that in the in last year, in the last last year legislative session, Maine actually passed legislation to pass legislation. If that makes sense, they actually said yes, we want to do an extended producer responsibility program. They tasked their environmental agency with developing the rule language. That was debated this year. Um, and it did not get passed. And actually, a bill in California also did not get passed. And I think a lot of it has to do with the COVID-19. As I said, we're seeing a somewhat of a slowdown in, it, in the initiatives. And what's also interesting is Recology, which is an environmental group, uh, has put on uh, a ballot initiative in California. It basically, um, the way California works is if, if, is if you get enough signatures, you can actually get a ballot initiative, in other words, a, a question put out to the voters. And basically what they want to do is they want to be able to tax plastics in California. Again, an extended producer responsibility type of requirement. Because of the failure of the California legislature to pass a bill, the, the activists have actually begun putting together a ballot initiative, and I think they're going to get enough signatures that it's going to appear on the ballot in November. Um, the Oregon governor signed a law banning uh, plastic bags and plastic straws, uh, and, and, you, and, and that's not just one state. I mean, that's pretty common throughout most of the states. Another headline, it's time to regulate the fashion industry the way we relate, regulate the oil industry. So if any of you are involved in apparel decoration, if you're involved in, in, uh, in, in point of purchase display, fabrics, textiles, things like that, there's tremendous pressure right now on fabrics and textiles in terms of the environmental impact, starting from the way that the material is either you know, grown, if it's cotton, how it's dyed, how it's processed, and what happens at the end. The word fast fashion is getting a lot of attention. 
Um, and again, Canada has moved forward with a single-use plastics ban, and, and the European Union has come out with a new circular economy plan aimed to have have its, half, have its waste by 2030. Why? Because a lot of the waste that the EU is sending for processing and recycling that they were collecting uh, went to China. So what does this mean in terms of responses from companies? Well, Danone, which is a very, very large major brand, you may be familiar with Dan and Yogurt, but there's a photo at the bottom of a lot of products that they supply. They've came out with an announcement because of the circular economy, because of the issues that are going on. And if you think about it, a lot of their products are produced in packaging or very hard or very difficult. I mean, plastic packaging are very hard or very difficult to recycle packaging, right? So they've come out with their, their three-step plan. Um, they're going to eliminate packaging that's not necessary. They're going to innovate, so all packaging needed is designed to be safely reused, recycled, or composted. And they're going to ensure that the packaging produced stays in the economy and never becomes a waste or pollution. That's their goal. That is a response to the pressures that have just recently emerged over the last year, year and a half. And so when you have a company of that size saying, this is what we're going to do, and then you look at their product and you look at all the materials that they have available, that's a major ambitious goal. But don't, don't be fooled into thinking that they're not going to be acting on this because they made this as a public statement. What are we seeing in terms of emerging trends? Well, from a packaging perspective, we're seeing uh, replacing plastics with other materials, for example, aluminum paper. The photo on this slide is actually a paper bottle, if you can believe that. And so we've seen uh, paper bottles emerge, not just from a home, but from a, uh, a home care. This is like uh, lotions and things like that. But we've actually seen some of the um, major uh, liquor companies start looking at packaging their liquor in paper bottles. And I could have never imagined or fathomed that we would have a paper bottle. Uh, they're changing packaging materials to make them more re more recyclable. In fact, I have an example of a. Uh, moving moving away from a multi-layer flexible packaging to a single-layer flexible packaging. Multi-layer flexible packaging is basically uh, non-recyclable under the current technology. It's very difficult to recycle that material. Some of it can be, some of it can't. If you can make a mono-layer, the problem is the, bright, the reason why the multi-layer flexible packaging is effective is because the multi-layers provide the protection to the product that's necessary, right? So we want to have things that are well protected. We want to have things that are preserved. But on the other hand, when we're done using that packaging, what do we do with it? New polymers. In fact, there's breakthroughs almost every day. You have a, a, a across the world, literally, where there's new polymers that are coming. They're making things more readily recyclable. They're making things more readily compostable. And then there's new recycling processes. Basically, uh, the, the concept of term chemical recycling is starting to become pretty common. And there's been some breakthroughs in terms of chemical recycling versus mechanical. A lot of the recycling that occurs now with plastic is mechanical. What we mean by that is we basically take PET bottles, for example, soda bottles, pop bottles. They get ground up and chipped. They get washed. The labels get removed and then they get reprocessed back into PET. That's a mechanical process. A chemical process base, basically takes that plastic polymer and breaks it down into its basic components, and then they can start over and rebuild new, uh, new chemicals. And of course, pyrolysis is a process that's used to break down chemical plastics, and they're moving to improve that process. So let's look at a couple examples. Um, and I thought, you know, wow, that's a lot of stuff to talk about, Gary. It's pretty global. What does this really mean? Well, I thought this was interesting. The Hard Rock Stadium, this came out in January of this year. Hard Rock Stadium is going to utilize, well, of course, now we don't have sporting events, but whenever sporting events come back on, they come back online, they're going to utilize recycled aluminum cups in a sustainability initiative versus using plastic cups. Uh, so they're going to be using metal cups, aluminum cups, that are more readily recyclable than those plastic, you know, you, you know, the red uh, solo cups, not to blame solo, but the red solo cup. Uh, Maine passed the, first, passed the first state ban on foam packaging. And again, foam packaging uh, is, it, while it's recyclable, there really isn't an, it, there isn't an outlet for that material to get collected, easily collected and easily recycled, right? Um, and then I thought this was an interesting article. This was from Flexible Packaging from February how canned water could impact the packaging industry. We're starting to see a shift because plastics are under the gun. Plastics are getting a lot of pressure. 
Uh, and, and therefore, so the companies that produce products and put them into plastic of course, are paying attention to that. They still want consumers to purchase their products. They still want to do the right thing. And so there was an expose, a nice article written about the impact that uh, shifting to aluminum cans for water versus plastic uh, is going to provide for a more recyclable uh, and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a more sustainable manner, according to the, the work that was done by the by the company, this uh, this just li literally just came out within the past couple weeks. Uh, a new flexi flexible packaging material. This is a uh, company in Germany that's making uh, pet food. And basically, what's interesting about this package is that it's now a mono material. It's a polyethylene-based product. It's a barrier that with a barrier that's fully recyclable. In other words, instead of having a multi-layer package. Uh, that is very difficult or almost impossible to recycle, that this company has shifted to a, a material for their flexible packaging that is completely recyclable. Uh, and again, this just came out literally within the past couple weeks. Reusables. Now, this is interesting. Now, and also, too, the other thing I want you to, to think about as I'm going through these, through these examples, which I think are, are absolutely interesting as to where the market's going, the thing that I want you to think about is the position that you're in with respect to the products that you're producing and your customer base. If you're supporting a packaging company, if you're supporting someone who's producing point of purchase display materials, if you're if you're supporting someone who's producing vinyl barrier, uh, vinyl um, uh, 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 signs, for example, and, and using these types of materials, you got to be thinking and back to yourself, well, where can this go? Well, from a packaging perspective and from other pack other perspectives, labels, for example, also very important. What would happen um, in terms of a disruptor if we start to see a reduction in the volume of packaging that's required? So what we're starting to see now is the rise of what are called reusables. Now, again, if we think back to our, our model of the circular economy, this is one component of a circular economy. So we're starting to see the rise of water bottles, grocery bags, right? There's a big debate right now going on because of COVID-19. A lot of stores will not allow you to bring a reusable grocery bag into, into, into the store because of the concern with the viruses. And so straws are the same thing. And, and this, I was literally on a webinar earlier today where there was a big discussion going on about how uh, folks have studied reusable grocery bags saying that the concerns that people have with them uh, aren't as great as what we originally thought. And I think that's because they, they, they have temporarily lifted some of these bans to allow these single-use grocery bags to be continued during the COVID-19. But there's silicone food bags, makeup removers are reusable, silicone dishwashing sponges, food wraps, uh, wool dryer balls, instead of using dryer sheets, the wool dryer balls last longer and longer. Again, some of these may not be obvious in terms of what's happening, but these are the real, what I call the rise of reusables. There's a company called TerraCycle, uh, where they actually launch with many big brands, um, a multi-use packaging designed to be purchased, returned back to them, cleaned, refilled, and resold. And so instead of just throwing that packaging away, TerraCycle is now providing a service where they'll collect that material and, and return it back into the economy. And then really, then you have a movement now of package-free shop and pre-cycle in New York City. They cater to shoppers looking to go waste-free with items sold in bulk or in usable non-plastic packaging. In other words, you would buy it once and refill it. Some of you may be familiar like with a growler, for example, where you like to get some cider or you might like to get some other adult beverages, where you buy that package, you buy that container, uh, you pay a price up front, but when you go back to refill it, you know, you don't have to pay for it again. You keep reusing that same that same type of package. So that's basically where the reusable market's headed. And, and it's not quite sure. I don't know, and I can't predict where it's going to end up. But uh, in terms of the reusables, there's a rise of the reusables. Now, this next two examples, to me, are absolutely fascinating. Purdue is now trialing a new meat packing foam that dissolves in your sink. Think about when you go to the grocery store and you buy meat for the week, right? It comes in a foam package that's wrapped in plastic and polymer. And if our goal was to reduce our, our, our dependency upon plastics and packaging, Purdue said, well, let's take a look at the tray that we're using, the meat tray, and think about all the millions of styrofoam meat trays that are used. What happens if we can make that thing go away and it becomes completely recyclable? 
So they're working on one that dissolves in your sink. In other words, you don't. It's it's a compostable foam made of cornstarch that disintegrates under running water. And to take that one step further, this is absolutely fascinating to me. Nivea, which we know uh, is a healthcare, you know, and they offer um, you know uh, moisturizing lotions and other things like that. They also offer soap. But they're trialing a package uh, for their soap that basically dissolves in the shower. And I think to me that's very, very interesting in terms of in terms of the thoughts that people are looking at with respect to all this pressure that's on there. Again, think about disruptions. What's going to disrupt your market? Where can those disruptions come from? And understand that these disruptions are happening a lot faster <laughs> uh, than than you would have imagined. Now, this I just came across, which I thought was also another interesting way about lab now, if you're in the label market, this is very, very interesting in terms of emerging. Basically, this is an inline labeling system that eliminates having to buy separate labels, pressure sensitive labels, for example, from a supplier where you're able to be able, be able to apply the actual label in line while they're doing the packaging of the material. And this example here happens to be a bottle of gin. And maybe after I'm done with my presentation, everyone might, might need to go visit the bottle of gin or, or your favorite beverage. But basically, this technology uh, is new, but it's also been demonstrated to be, uh, 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 um, oh, what's the word? Uh, it's, it, it's been demonstrated to, to work in practice, right? So it's integrated into a rigid packaging line. It uses conventional inline narrow web press uh, in combination with modified pressure sensitive label application hardware, where they're actually printing the label, applying the label in line, uh, and eliminating the need to go outside for someone to produce those labels. And it gives you a much a, a, an excellent look, I think, if you look at the example on the right. So, COVID 19, um, you know, we, there's nothing that uh, we can't avoid not talking about COVID-19. A couple things on observations regarding sustainability. What was interesting is the last time that we had an economic downturn of this nature, of this magnitude, was in 2008. What happened in 2008 from a sustainability perspective is that it caused a significant drop in emphasis on sustainability. Um, there, you know, the sustainability was, was, was emerging. It was a hot topic, uh, and then it kind of went down for a period of time and it started to come back up, right? So it runs through a, it was running through a cyclical motion, never really went away. But what we noticed is that, is that after the economic downturn, there was less emphasis on sustainability. During the current pandemic, again, same situation, economic downturn, different reason, obviously, but this has actually resulted in a higher interest on sustainability. In fact, according to Google Trends, the search interest on how to live a sustainable lifestyle increased by more than 4,550%. So what do we mean? What, do we, what does that really mean? It means, well, obviously people are confined to their homes, not like 2008, 2008, you could go out, you could still do the things that you like to do, go to sporting events and things like that. Maybe you couldn't do as much, but you were still able to do it. They began to consider how to live more independently and perhaps consume less right, because everybody was trapped in their home. And then, of course, the use of certain single-use plastics increased due to sanitary concerns, grocery bags and coffee cups. You know, for example, Starbucks, they were really, they're pushing the reusable coffee cups, and they're like, well, no, we don't want you bringing those cups in because we're concerned about potential uh, uh, virus transmission to our employees. We want to keep our employees safe. So they swap back to using the disposable cups. But once the, and, and then again, now we're starting to see literally on that webinar today is that people are now starting to question that, especially when it comes to the grocery bags. But that was, I think, is just a temporary, a temporary uh, situation. Uh, this quote I thought was very interesting. George Seraphim, a senior partner, co-founder of KKS Advisors, professional business administration at Harvard Business School stated that this crisis has shown that environmental social governance, social investing, is here to stay. ESG is not a fad. People are looking for resilience. They're looking for companies that are able to weather the short term and are positioned the business for long-term success. And you can see on the right-hand side in terms of the tracking of ESG money flows. Now, again, this is going to be for publicly traded companies, but it gives you an indication. But look at right before the, the – right before the – the COVID pandemic really hit. Look at how high the investment was. Of course, there's going to be a drop off in investment because of the economic impact. But if you look at the very last two bars, you saw it go down, and then you start to see it starting to rise as we move through 2020. 
And so this tells us a couple important things. A, that sustainability is here to stay. The momentum on sustainability, while it slowed a bit because of COVID-19, clearly is, 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 is something that hasn't stopped. And, and the focus on, I think, sustainability is going to continue. Another great quote that we pulled out is when a crisis such as COVID-19 strikes, if you have a strong culture and a shared sense of purpose, that your leader's role model, that your leaders, a very important word, leader's role model every day, you can weather the storm better than most. In other words, um, when you have these situations like this and you look at sustainability and how it fits into your operation, how it fits into your customer's operation, when you start to resume that business or if that activity starts to pick up, those who are best prepared to respond to that are going to do the greatest in terms of, in terms of their recovery and their operations. So, you know, managing sustainability through global disruption, of course, we want to prioritize safety and economic recovery now, while maintaining momentum where possible on our other sustainability issues. And understand where these disruptors, as I said, these, what I shared with you, those few examples, are just literally a few examples of what's occurring. I get every day in my email, I get updates where uh, there are, seems, it seems endless in terms of the number of companies, brands that are the big brands. That are that are commonplace that we see day in and day out are all make all looking at how they can deal with this issue. How can they deal with sustainability? How can they look at at the circular economy? How can they make their products fit into the circular economy model? You need to, of course, refocus your sustainability priorities in the medium term and seize the opportunities to rebuild through sustainability. Of course, incorporate scenario analysis and long-term risk analysis into your planning to build resilience. As I said that these disruptions that are happening, going package-free or label-free. If you're a label printer, if you're a packaging printer, and I know I've been focusing a lot on packaging and labeling, um, but if even if you're producing you know, annual reports or if you're producing uh, materials for your customers that are advertising, things like that, what happens if the customer says, well, you know, with the sustainability, we don't want to make these investments anymore. We don't want to have to pay the tax that may be coming from extended producer responsibility. How are you, as a supplier to that, going to respond? And are you monitoring those? And are you talking with your customers about what could potentially happen? What, what are the scenarios, right? And, of course, encourage a strong leadership and transparent demonstration of values on social issues to your staff. Again, the workforce development issue is critical. If we are going to continue to grow and thrive as an industry, we have to attract young people in. We have to get people engaged in the industry. And sustainability is going to be a key element in terms of what that's going to do. So I threw this slide in and say, you know, what is sustainable printing? Well, I've been talking a lot about the actual product that we produce. But in addition, remember that we have to produce that product through our manufacturing process. And, and it's more than just recycled paper and soy inks. It's really a holistic approach to how you operate your business. You need to look at how can we reduce overall environmental impact? How can we reduce toxics and waste? incorporation of more renewable resources into what we're doing, not only just our products, but how do we operate our business that way? We can we reduce fossil fuel energy consumption. How do we address social issues? And of course, we all understand right now there's a lot of social unrest going on across the country. How do we address these social issues in the context of producing a product that's more sustainable? And, and sustainability is basically a continuous improvement process. It's not a single event such, such as becoming FSC certified. In fact, FSC certification is basically it's a it's a it's a good certification because in terms of what it's addressing, which is you know illegally sourced or 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 unsustainable uh, sourced fiber, but it's only a single attribute. So I always like to say to folks, you can become FSC certified and still be dumping everything out the back 40, and you still get FSC certified because they don't look at that. They only look at your the way that you're able to trace and track where that fiber came from. I'm not saying it's not an important certification, it's just it's a limited certification. So becoming FSC certified doesn't particularly make you a sustainable company. It's one of many things that you should be doing as a company along the certification pathway. Um, again, it's a combination of many ongoing activities and most importantly, it's not greenwashing. You must be credible and you must be transparent in your messaging, not, to, not only to your customers, but to your staff and to your suppliers. 
I, there's a lot of suppliers who are willing to support companies along their sustainability journey. You want to embrace those suppliers. You want to bring them along. But you must have a credible and transparent message that you're communicating out to the community and out to everyone as a whole. Okay. So uh, we're going to wrap up. We're going to talk about Sustainable Green Printing Partnership, and I think there'll be some time for questions. Uh, what I wanted to bring to your attention, if you're not familiar with the Sustainable Green Printing Partnership, it's basically uh, a certification program uh, that was created uh, by the printing industry for the printing industry. The most important thing to understand is that it's not necessarily run by the printing industry. Uh, it's an independent nonprofit certification organization. Now, Companies that are engaged in the program, that are certified facilities, that are vendors and suppliers that are supporting that, uh, do, act, uh, do, uh, are, are represented on the board of directors. They make up the board of directors, uh, uh, and they make the decision in terms of where the organization goes. But essentially, it's a credible system that identifies sustainable green graphic arts facilities for customers and consumers. It's a third-party audit is required for certification. So that's where the transparency and credibility comes in. The auditor that audits the facility um, is trained in printing. They understand printing operations, but they are not affiliated at all with any of the organizations that support the uh, SGP program. It's a holistic approach, development of certification of sustainable business practices. So really what, this, what the SGP program focuses on is the manufacturing process. But there's this clear set of criteria that defines sustainable green printing facilities. Um, they deal with economic, environmental, and social responsibility. These are the three pillars, the elements, uh, people, planet, profit, right, that, 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 that pervade sustainability and actually pervade the criteria for SGP. And so you say, well, what does it mean to be certified? Well, first of all, you've undergone a third-party certification audit. You also are able to show that you comply with all relevant health, safety, environmental regulations. You cannot be a superior environmental performer and then find out that you are now out of violation. You're not in compliance with a particular requirement. So one of the foundation, one of the founding requirements is that you have to be in compliance with your EPA and your OSHA requirements. You have to have developed and implemented a sustainability management system. And again, a sustainable management system is, is that holistic approach. It's a framework by which you would operate under, under the sustainability criteria, under, and under the aspects associated with being a sustainable operation. Uh, there's a set of best practices, a conforming to a set of best practices. Uh, and you're tracking key sustainability metrics. Again, the issue of transparency and credibility, there's a whole set of metrics that you need to track. In fact, the metrics are good because you can report on your progress. For example, you've reduced your energy, you've reduced your solid waste. A lot of the companies that are SGP certified focus on energy and solid waste because it's a win-win-win. If you can reduce your solid waste, you reduce your environmental impact and you reduce your operating costs. Uh, if you reduce your energy consumption, you've reduced your energy, you've reduced the amount of pollution that's going in the air because of the energy that's being consumed and uh, you reduce your operating costs. So one of, the, one of the key things about being a certified facility is that it gives you more of a focus on your operating costs, and a lot of facilities have reported that. It allowed them to focus a lot closer on their operating costs and find opportunities to reduce those costs. And then you have to do an annual continuous improvement project. Because sustainability is a continuous improvement process, uh, you have to pick a project. You pick the project. The facility, the, the program doesn't pick it. The facility picks a project to work on every year, um, and it could be really any project that you really want, anything that's going to hit the elements of being sustainable. Again, as we said, some companies work on reducing energy. Some companies are working on reducing water consumption. Some companies are reducing uh, the volatile organic compounds or air pollution emissions. It's really up to the facility. They can pick that continuous improvement project and work on it um, as, as, as through the course of the year and as they've identified it themselves. So I know I covered a lot of information in a short time period, maybe spoke a little faster because I wanted to make sure I got through it, but here we are at the end. What's our observations? What, what, what's our takeaways? What, what, can we, what can we assimilate from the information that we went through? Well, first of all, I think it's important to understand that sustainability is evolving. In fact, I would say in certain instances, it's evolving a lot faster than it ever has, uh, and it's more than just being green, right? And actually, this whole issue of green and sustainability extends beyond the companies 
uh, that traditionally think of themselves as, as a non-green facility, a non-green operation. Why? Because the, these changes are happening at the customer level, right? The circular economy is emerging and becoming a driving force. And, and as we watch and observe this, the circular economy is going to continue to play a more significant role in terms of products that are produced uh, for, for the um, U.S., but not just the U.S., but across the world. Sustainability is not a threat. It's a journey with many opportunities. You have to be able to recognize where those opportunities lie, and that requires doing research, doing some reading, talking with your customers, talking with your suppliers, understanding where the market's going, understand where your customers are going, and then figuring out how you can fit in on that. Uh, here's a, for, here's a, for a, a great example. Um, the extended producer responsibility, the way that these extended producer responsibility programs are set up, and actually Canada has had them for, had them for quite some time and so has Europe. And uh, well, the way that the main program was set up was that for materials that were more difficult to recycle, you paid a higher fee or a higher tax. Materials that were more readily recyclable, the tax became less. So uh, by looking at that, if you say, okay, well, we're producing product A for our customer. We're using this particular material. Is it readily recyclable or not readily recyclable? Is there a way that we could maybe offer our customer a different substrate or a different material to make it more readily recyclable? Therefore, the fee that they would pay would go down. Who's going to have the competitive advantage, right? It's going to be the company that's bringing the solution to the customer, not letting the customer come up with a solution and dictate it. So working in partnership with your customers is going to be critical. Again, sustainability is no longer a market-driven phenomenon. At one time, it was pretty much market-driven. What we're seeing is a dramatic increase in regulatory requirements. We're seeing, and actually, and I kind of skipped over this, but in, the, in, in Congress, there were six pieces of legislation that have been introduced regarding some form or some type of sustainability, uh, dealing with ocean plastics, single-use plastics, uh, breaking, um, one of them was breaking our, our uh, dependency on plastics. And so now that we have legislation being introduced at the federal level, um, that means it's risen to that level of, of focus uh, by, by, on a national level. Sustainability has changed the way in which many companies are doing business. I can, I can give you uh, countless examples of how people have reoriented their business. Um, and it's becoming more mainstream for their businesses. Um, a great case study, if you have some time, look up a company called Texas Nameplate. Texas Nameplate is a company that makes the, the nameplates for equipment, and they completely revamped their entire operation and built a new facility completely focused on sustainability. It's an awesome case study. Uh, sustainability differentiates companies in the marketplace, and of course, the sustainability movement, I think, is here to stay. I think the statistics have shown that through this COVID-19, yes, there was a slight decrease in it. We've seen a slight pause, but I think as soon as we get through this crisis, I think we're going to see the momentum pick up um, and continue to push forward on, on making changes. And this, as I said, the circular economy is the term you want to start using in your nomenclature and your vocabulary. So, okay. Well, that brings us to the questions and answers. So, Jeff, I think we have some time for some questions, if, if we have any that had came in while I was, uh, while I was talking. Uh, yep, we have a little time here, so we'll try to get to a couple. Um, one question, Gary, that we had is on the Sustainable Print Partnership, uh, the certification. You know, a lot of the people in, involved with, uh, with the conference these two days aren't actual printers. They're doing finishing, finishers or binders. So they're not a printer themselves. Are they eligible for the certification as oh, well? Yes, most yeah, most definitely they're eligible for the certification. In-plant printing operations are eligible. Packaging operations, anybody affiliated with the industry is eligible uh, to to get certified under the program. It's not it's not limited at all. You know, a, a few years ago, it's been a little time, but I I was involved with some specifics that would be bindery and finishing oriented. So I think there's some things there that uh, that are that can be used that are very specific to finishing and bindery. So um, oh, if, there's, if there's questions on that, they can definitely, I'm sure, ask you or, or ask me and we can look into that. Um, oh, yeah. Another question that, that, that came back, uh, or you know, I think back when you were talking a little bit more on plastics, um, and they asked on foam or plastic, is there one that's better than the other? 
was the question. Well, you know, uh, I think then you have to get into the details. Foam is typically styrofoam, you know, versus plastic. Then the issue becomes what's the resin system that's involved with the plastic. Um, you know, what we've seen is that in, in many areas of the, in the world of plastics, a lot of these resins are, are I hate to use the word non-recyclable, they are technically recyclable. The issue is there's no market for them. You know, uh, PET, for example, that, that is fairly readily recyclable. The challenge with PET is the label. And you'll see, like, with shrink wrap labels that are put on some PET bottles, some PET base bottles, that's where the challenge is getting those labels, right, getting the labels to be compatible with the recycling process and whether it can be washed off during the recycling process. And there's been a lot of effort to try and come up with specifications to make those more recyclable. Foam, styrofoam, actually is technically recyclable. Again, the problem is the collection of the styrofoam, the processing of the styrofoam, and, and then how, and how does it get recycled and returned back into it. And the problem is with no market, um, it's, it's easier on the part of the government to actually ban them. I, I'm not a big proponent of government banning anything. Uh, I, I think that what the government should do, in my opinion, my humble opinion, is they shouldn't ban things. They should make things, they should uh, allow us to create, give us some time and space to create opportunities to take those materials and recycle them. Uh, you know, because the ban on plastic straws, for example, um, you saw people that rely upon straws, believe it or not, to be able to eat and drink. We're now kind of stuck because they couldn't get a readily supply of straws. And then you saw McDonald's, I think, with the paper straws. Well, the paper straws are kind of falling apart. So there wasn't a great solution relative to banning of the plastic straws. But if there's a way that we can actually get those materials collected and recycled, you know, in, in is an economically viable. Part of it is technically some of the stuff is, is, is recyclable technically, but is there a market for it and can it be collected? The key thing is in the collection of the material and bringing it back into and circling it back into the um, – into the into the economy, so to speak, it back into reprocessing. Great, Gary. Thank you very much. We're running out of time here. I did want to say real quick to everyone that starting right away here in about five minutes, you'll have the ability to get on our digital decorating panel on uh, digital foil, digital coatings. Um, it's a great, going to be a great panel, and then uh, also. This afternoon, you'll be able to see the, the revealing of all of our FSEA Gold Leaf Awards. So all that's going to be available here right after 1 o'clock. Um, so stay on and, and, and see all the great things that's going to happen this afternoon. Gary, thank you so much uh, to get us updated on sustainability. I think there was some great information there. Uh, we really appreciate it, and uh, we'll talk very soon. Oh, thanks for having me, Jeff. Talk to you later. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.